you know you love, make some noise. Come on, we're going to sing about the Father's love toward us. Put your hands together. There's nothing worth having if I don't have you. Nothing worth achieving if I can't reach you. Hey. The only thing I need, you've already given me. I am yours and you are mine. Come on. My desire is to know you. I delight in hearing your voice. Oh, Father's love. Hey, come on. Put your hands together. Oh. Come on, I tried searching. Searching for more, but kept coming up short. Well, I was looking for a prize. Looking for a prize, I was waiting. The only thing I need, you've already given me. I am yours and you are mine. My desire is to know you. I delight in hearing your voice. All I want is to be closer to you. There's nothing like my father's love. Come on, this is your identity. I was made for my father's arms. I was made for my father's love. I found who I am and who you are. Come on, I was made. I was made for my father's arms. I was made. I was made for my father's arms. I was made for my father's love. I found who I am. Would you just make some noise? If you're in this place and you're facing shame and you're facing sin, just know that you are loved, that there is hope for you, and that when you surrender, there's nothing like his love. We're going to sing. Lord, here I am. You know the real me. I cannot hide my weakness I don't understand how you could love me I don't deserve your kindness Right when I feel like I've run out of chances You're there to meet me again Every time you make beauty from ashes Seven times seven you keep on forgiving me seven times seven Fear and 
I'm 70. You keep on forgiving me. Seven times 70. to be at our very first Her Story Conference. Well, if we haven't met yet, my name is Erica and I get to serve as one of the leaders for Her Story. It's an honor and a privilege to see this, to see this room full of, full of women. This is an answered prayer, guys. And so we have a day jam-packed. It's a schedule with amazing speakers like Andy Andrew, Alexander Hoover, and our very own Pastor Liz. Yeah! She's gonna be speaking in session one. I am so excited. All right, so can we just take a moment, everyone, to honor our pastors, Pastor JJ and Liz, for creating the space, for making Jesus accessible to anyone, and especially you, Pastor Liz, for pouring into our women, and not only Journey's women, but the women of our community. We love you so much. And so I said we have a jam-packed day. So I want to show you guys the schedule so that we can run through it so you have an idea of what today is going to look like. So it's going to be right behind me. We have session one coming up. This, we're actually in it. Then we have session two. Then we're going into lunch. And at lunch, we have three amazing food trucks. We've got Colombian. We have barbecue. And we have chicken and waffle grill. So we got all the options. <laughs> And also, after that, we're going into breakouts, and we have Pastor Jenny speaking here in the auditorium. And then we have Alana Blackwell speaking in the next steps room. I don't even know which one to pick, guys. It's gonna be so good, but you guys have that decision. <laughs> and then right after that, we're jumping right into session three. And then last but not least, we have the after party. Guys, if you think the lobby looks good now, just wait, because we have more surprises for you guys. And this is just a chance for you to meet women that you may have never met before, and also just take really cool pictures. <laughs> I'm available for all kinds of selfies with everyone. I'm so, so, so excited. All right, so I'm gonna pray. We're gonna go in, we're gonna watch a video and then go into one more song of worship. 
Father God, thank you so much for this group of women. Lord, thank you for allowing us to gather here, that the enemy probably didn't want all of us to be here gathered because he wants to keep us separated. But God, we are here because of you, because we want your presence, because we want more of you, God. So thank you. And we just ask that everyone's heart is open for what you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I see God in the glory of his creation. I see him in the uniqueness of who he made me to be. I see God in each stage of grief. In the absence of my loved one, your presence was found. I see God every time I think about the impossible, when he makes a way, even when I thought there was no way. I see God in nature, in the strength of the mountains and the fierceness of the sunset. I feel him when I breathe in and feel my lungs fill with air and I know that I'm alive and he's not done. Holy Spirit, we desire, we desire a fresh wind of God. Holy Spirit, blow a fresh wind upon these women. Move 
There's power in the O's.
I just call on his name. Just say his name right now, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The name above every name, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that your presence is here. We thank you that all we have to do is call in your name and you show up. Like you give us that access, Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and just being there for us through it all, God. We thank you. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Well, what is up, Her Story Conference? Wow. I'm so excited you guys are here. You guys can go ahead and take your seat. If I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, my name is Liz. Alongside my husband, Pastor JJ, we lead Journey Church. It is the honor and privilege of our lives. I still am just, when I drive to the parking lot, I'm like, I can't believe we get to do this. Like, this is crazy. It's going to be six years. And speaking of that, I remember the first time we did an event for women. I think it was like a year in, right? And it was called Her Night. It was so much work. And... <laughs> I remember the ladies afterwards coming up to me and they're like, Pastor Liz, this was awesome. Um, can we do, because y'all show up, by the way. Every time we do events, you guys show up. Like, I love that about women and just the women of journey too. Um, and they were like, we're we going to do this again? I'm like, absolutely. They're like, when? I'm like, when one of y'all decides that you're going to lead this. Because <laughs> this is so much work. And so I just want to take a moment and honor these two ladies, Erica and Kim. Can you please stand up real quick? Also, their team, my gosh, yes, please. Just so you know, you guys paid to be here, but they don't get paid to do this. Like, you, it's a lot of work. They don't get paid to do this. So please, if you get the hookup somewhere, like you work at Disney, get some tickets, like do something to bless them. And then the team, I mean, I heard some ladies that were here from like 6.30 in the morning, 6 in the morning. Like I was waking up at that time and you guys were here. So just want to honor and take a moment to honor you for that. All right, so I'm going to go straight into it because I know, oh, man, they already started the timer, so I got to hurry it up. All right, I want to share and talk about um, the first time my car broke down and got stuck. So have you guys ever been in a situation where someone offered to help you and you're like, no, thanks, I got this, I'm good. And then afterwards you're like, man, I definitely should have accepted the help because I am stuck right now. Well, that happened to me the first time my car got stuck. So it was the second car. I say first time because my car has gotten stuck. <laughs> In my house growing up, we never bought new cars because my dad had this thing like you drive it off the lot and it's already worth like less, you know. So we always buy used cars. <laughs> that meant that we got stuck a lot, right. So the second car I had was a BMW 325i. Now before you guys start, ooh, she had a BMW. No, okay, this car was like 15 years old. My dad was in this phase where he liked to buy, like, vintage cars. So he called them vintage to make them sound cool. But that just, it was a problem. Okay, so this car had, the muffler was really loud. And you know how people, like, guys, they pay to have, like, their muffler souped up to sound loud? Well, mine just sounded loud because I had a hole in it. And I used to drive through parking garages, and I would set off car alarms, okay? <laughs> I'm not even lying. This is, like, so real, Okay. The, the AC didn't work, and we live in Florida, and then so you would put the windows down and they would get stuck. And then it would do this thing where you're driving it, and it would like, you drive it and then it would just do this jump thing. It was so weird. <laughs> it was crazy. People would get in my car, they're like, what's going on with your car? I'm like, it's, I got hydraulics, okay? Like, <laughs> and then to make it worse, like I didn't take it to get an oil change, but then I had like leopard print car seat covers. like. It was crazy. But then I would do this thing where I would just turn off the car and turn it back on, and it was fine. Well, there was this one time where I'm driving down. I don't know if you guys know the roads out here, but Central Florida Parkway, about to cross over John Young. It's a major intersection. I'm in the middle lane, and the car does the whole boom thing. Like it did. <laughs> and so the guy, this guy next to me sees what's happening. So he's like, hey, my windows are down, of course, because they're stuck down, like I said. And he's like, hey, do you need some help? And I'm like, no, thanks. I got this. And the light turns green and he goes, and I'm sitting there, like it would not go. Like I keep trying and would not go. Y'all, I was stuck. And I'm like, man, I should have like accepted his help. It started to rain. Again, my windows are stuck down, so I can't do nothing about it. I'm in the middle lane. What am I going to do? So thank God somebody else came up. They asked me if I needed help. I was like, yes, please. And we had to push the car on the side of the road. My, I called my dad. Um, I borrowed their cell phone because this is 
so long ago, y'all, I had like a pager at the time. I didn't even have a cell phone, okay? So I borrowed their cell phone, called my dad. He came, towed the car. I'm like, this is your fault because you're buying me old cars. And then <laughs> took me to work. Right. Okay, so the reason why I share this story is because it wasn't until I realized that I needed the help that I accepted it. And it wasn't until I accepted the help that I got to my destination. See, the, the reason why I share this story with you is because a lot of times a lot of us look like we have it all figured out on the outside to everybody else. But really we're struggling hard. And, and God has destinations that he wants to take us to. He has purposes that he wants to fulfill in our lives. But it's, it just doesn't happen because we don't want to depend on him. And all the while he sees us struggling and he's like, I can help you if you just depend on me. But every time we turn around and say, no, I think I can do this on my own. We're basically saying, no thanks, I got this. Which leads me to the title of my talk, no thanks, I got this. Where, where are all my independent ladies at? Woo, all right. I like this crowd because you guys are like interacting with me. Every time I say independent ladies, it triggers me into thinking of like Beyonce or what the Destiny Child. I think that was when she was still with Destiny Child, right? All my women independent. When I say that too, it like totally ages me. If y'all don't know, I'm 40 years old. Can you believe it? Like what? I still can't believe it because our church is so young. I'm like, I swear, like, I'm 20 sometimes. I'm like, no, I'm 40. When I wake up in the morning, my back hurts. But anyways, we're the ones that, like, like, whenever we find out how much it costs to, like, do something in our house, we're like, no, thanks, I got this. I could figure it out, right? Like, I remember the first house that my husband and I got. We had popcorn ceiling. Does anybody know what popcorn ceiling? It is the worst. It's, like, from the 80s. It's terrible. And, like... So we, I was like, babe, we need to scrape the ceiling because I get allergies. Also, it's ugly. But also, I'm sorry if you have popcorn ceiling, by the way. <laughs> but I get allergies. And when you try to vacuum, have you ever tried to vacuum popcorn ceiling? It just looks like, it, it looks like a bunch of uh, spiders had eggs, like laid eggs all over the ground. So my husband tried to scrape it. Y'all, he got to, like, the living room, and then that was it. Like, he was in, he's like, I can't do this, right? But, like, that's what we do, right? Like, whenever we ask our kids to help us with the dishes, and then we see that they're not doing it right, we're like, no, thanks, I got this. Let me just do it, right? Or, like, there's a project at work, and you need help, and you know you should delegate, but you don't, right? Because you're like, no, thanks, I got this, because you're afraid that they're not going to do it right. And, and why do we do that? Like, why don't we want to depend on other people? Because we feel like they're not going to do it right, then that also means that we're going to have to give up control, right? Or we feel like we're going to have to, to wait on them. And it's, it's going to take some time, right? And nobody wants to be dependent, right? Like, who, whenever you do your taxes, who are your dependents? They're usually kids and babies, right? Babies are dependent. Nobody wants to be a baby. Sounding, sounding right? <laughs> sounding dependent sounds bad, right? Synonyms for dependent are... Subject to, controlled by, reliant on. That sounds bad, right? Independent sounds better. It sounds strong. Synonyms are self-made, self-sufficient, self-supporting. So the message is clear. Being dependent sounds bad. Independent sounds good, right? But the truth about independence is as much as we like the idea, it doesn't really exist, right? We call people who are dependent on drugs drug addicts. And that's bad. And we're good because we're not dependent on drugs. But maybe your drug is money and you're dependent on your finances, right? We call people who are dependent on alcohol, alcoholics, and that's bad. And we're good because we're not alcoholics and we're not dependent on that. But we're workaholics and we're dependent on our ability to succeed, our success, right? I wrote it this way. Independence is an illusion. We're all dependent on something. And if you take a second and think about it, what is it that you're dependent on? Was it, is it your health, your education, your finances, your family, maybe your spouse, your kids for that matter? And what happens if you're dependent on those things and they fall apart, right? And the question is always, what really is it that you're dependent on? Because we're all dependent on something. And the bigger question is, can you depend on what you're depending on? I know I'm saying the word dependent a lot and it sounds confusing, but what's going to happen if the market crashes or, or the education that you spent so much money on only takes you so far? Or a family member that you depend so much on dies or your spouse dies? What if we go through another pandemic? What if you lose your job? There's, if, you, if, if you're dependent on those things, what happens? Your world falls apart. And then a lot of us as Christians, what do we do when our world falls apart? We blame it on God, right? I've seen it happen. I've seen women 
who depend their joy on having a child. And then when they have a miscarriage and they lose their child, they also lose their faith in the process. I've seen couples who depend on, solely on their happiness with each other, right? They don't depend on God. They just depend on each other. And then what happens when you get a divorce and you walk away from each other? They also end up walking away from God. I've seen people, entrepreneurs who depend everything on their, their, their business. And then their business falls apart and they give up. And they also give up on God and the process. We can't blame God if we're not allowing him to be the foundation in our lives. I wrote it this way. God never fails us. We fail God when we fail to make him the foundation of our lives. When we fail to depend on him. Matthew 7, 24, 27 says this. These words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life. And I highlighted that portion. Not incidental additions to your life. Homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. Rain poured down. The river flooded or tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed to the rock. I wrote it this way. God can't just be an addition to our lives. He has to be the foundation. He has to be the foundation. Do, we, do I have any makeup artists in the house? It's right. That's what I was asking her earlier. Any makeup artist knows that, like, okay, after the skincare and all that, what is the first thing that you have to get right as far as makeup-wise? Primer or foundation. There you go. <laughs> Come on. You guys got to help me with this illustration. So I read online. Okay, and this is not even, this is not Bible. Okay, what I'm about to read to you is online. They're talking about makeup. This is a makeup artist. This is what she said. Foundation mistakes might not be something you give much thought to, but it's called foundation for a reason. Get it wrong and everything that you build on top of it will be compromised and won't last long. Get it right, on the other hand, and what might before have been good will be excellent, solid, and long-lasting. I'm preaching makeup right now, y'all. For real. Like, next time you put on your foundation, God has to be the foundation of my life. Like, you got to remember that. Yes. And it's, it's the same thing with God. Like, you have to make him the foundation. You got to put him on first. You got to put him on right. Because if you don't, everything that you add on top of it, it's just not going to work. It's going to fall apart. You try to add your finances, your job, your kids, everything else is going to fall apart. But if you put him right, if you put him on first, give him the, the rightful place of first in your life, then everything else that you add on top of it will be, like the makeup artist said, will be good, solid, and long-lasting. Now, the best way to have a good foundation, and this is the premise of everything I'm talking about, is to depend on him. See, we're living in a time where independent women are celebrated, but we can't allow this idea of being independent, which I'm all about. Obviously, I'm a lady. I love watching the movies where, like, the women are the heroes, right? Like, I think, is it Super, no, Wonder Woman. That's, like, my favorite. My husband loves Marvel movies, and I'm like, Wonder Woman is where it's at, okay? And I'm all about that. But I wrote it this way. In an effort to fight for and become independent women, we can't become independent of God in the process. We need to make sure that God is our foundation. Yes, and we are dependent on him. So, I have 26 minutes. All right. We, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a Bible verse, and I'm going to talk about two trees. Everything I'm going to talk about is from two trees in the Bible, one that depends on God and one that doesn't. And this is found in Jeremiah 17, 5 through 10. If you don't have your Bible, you can read it on the screen behind me. Again, two trees, one that depends on God and one that doesn't. It says, this is what the Lord says, cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength, on yourself, and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs. Some versions of the Bible say tumbleweed in the desert with no hope for the future. They live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited salty land. I think you guys have the picture. I have a picture of, there you go. So this is what it looks like. I, I, I mean, it's super dramatic, but like I said, some versions say tumbleweed. Um, if you look at this, it's super dry, right? If a wind comes by and pushes on this, what's going to happen? It's just going to blow in the wind. It looks dead. It looks dry. This shrub has a no thanks, I got this attitude, right? But when we keep reading, it says, but blessed are those, this is the one that depends on God, who trust or depend on the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a river bank, river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. And I have another picture 
of what the Bible talks about, what it looks like. If you see it's green, it's lush, its roots are reaching deep into the water, which is the living water. But I'm not going to go into all that right there. But I want, to, I want to give you three things that you can learn from this tree that's dependent on God. And my first point is learn to depend on him when you're in the fire. Learn to depend on him when you're in the fire. Jeremiah 17.8 says, such trees are not bothered by heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. I don't know about you, but I've never heard of trees that their leaves stay green <laughs> with heat and with no water. Okay, I don't, how, how many plant people do I have? I know that's like a big, yes, it's a big thing. She's like, I'm kind of, I think so. I'm getting there. Some of my plants are dying, right? So like... <laughs> The plants are not going to survive under harsh conditions like heat and no water, right? Like I go out of town with my husband for like a week when he has a ministry trip. And I come back and my trees. And I have like the most like, like trees and uh, plants. I don't have trees in, inside my house. But <laughs> plants. I have the most like low maintenance plants. And still I come back. Their leaves are not green, right? They look like they're dying, right? But then, so I had to read this and be like, okay, God, what are you trying to tell me? And then I thought about this. I homeschool my kids, but I'm not that good in science. But I know this at least. When you combine heat and drought, what do you get? Heat and dry air, what do you get? Fire, exactly. So then it dawned on me that God is saying, if you depend on me in the midst of harsh conditions like fire, a.k.a. trials, you are, not going, you are going to survive and something good is going to come out of it. Yes, and it says they never stop producing fruit. And even reading that, I'm like, wait, so you're telling me that even in the fire I'm going to produce fruit? God, you got to explain this to me. I don't understand. So then as I kept reading, I found another Bible verse. And this is going to tell us how we can produce fruit even in the fire. And the answer to that is by God refining us. Zachari I mean, let me explain. Zechariah 13.9 says, this third I will put into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is our God. God's people, us, are to be put in the fire to be refined. And what does refine mean? It means remove unwanted elements or impurities. So basically what I'm saying is that when you depend on him and he allows you to go through trials, it's for a reason. It's because he's trying to take something out of you, right? And this is how this, is how this played out in my life. I know some of you don't know my story, but I lost my third son. Um, we have two boys, Justice and Zane, and then our third son, we lost him seven hours after I had him. And so I was put in the fire when I lost my son because God needed to remove ungratefulness, right? I didn't appreciate the kids that I had. So that's what he needed to remove from my life, right? I was put in the fire when I lost my sister last year to COVID. And, and, and that, at that time it was hard, but God needed to remove complacency because he showed me that your life is short. Don't waste it. You need to be working for God. Like don't sit around and do nothing. I was put in the fire when I found out that my husband was struggling with pornography. And I wanted to quickly just point the finger at him and judge him. And God showed me real quick that I had situations in my life that I was, I was dealing with, with anger and fear and doubt. And then he showed me that I needed to, to get rid of my gen, uh, judgmental attitude needed to be removed. And, and he needed to replace that with this unconditional love that actually saved my marriage. Some, sometimes some of you, you're, you're put in the fire of trials and, and you don't understand why. Maybe you're here and, and you're single and you're in, the, you're in the fire of being single. <laughs> but maybe God is allowing that in your life because you have some selfishness that he needs to get rid of, right? Because if he doesn't get rid of that... Whenever you get with this guy, you're going to really mess up that relationship. Maybe you're put in the fire of losing your job. And the reason why he's doing that in your life is because you need responsibility in your life, right? You need to get all that irresponsibility room. Maybe you were getting to work late. Whatever the situation was, God needed to take that out of you. And maybe you've been put in the fire of maybe like a mental health diagnosis. And God is, is trying to show you that you need to learn and trust and depend on him. He needs to take out this attitude of your just dependency on yourself. And that's why sometimes he puts us through the fire. The Bible verse again, it says, test them like gold. I read a quote from Katy Perry actually. And she was saying, I know. I know, but I got ministered to it, okay. Like, buy it. She said, the hotter the fire, the purer the gold. And that's true. Like the Bible verse says, test them like gold. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty bougie. 
I'm just going to admit it, all right? My husband says I'm allergic. He's, he has said this before. He's not even lying. I'm allergic to fake gold. If I wear fake gold earrings, I break out, okay? So I'm a little bougie in that way. I don't want to be that 10 karat gold, right? I want to be that 24 karat gold, right? And so you got to remember when you're put in that fire, it's because God's trying to make you that 24 karat gold. He wants to make you pure. And if you're here and you might not feel like 24 karat gold and you feel insufficient, well, then that leads me to my second point. Learn to depend on him when you feel insufficient. If you guys don't know what that means, that just means that you feel like you're not enough, right? And can I be real with you right now? I'm being like so, like this is the only way I know how to pastor is to be honest and real. Every time Pastor JJ asked me to grab the mic and to share, to speak, anytime, anybody, Erica, whoever, whatever event it is, I struggle so hard, y'all. I struggle so hard. I often feel like I feel insufficient. I feel like I don't know what I'm doing half the time. There's people who come to me and ask me questions. One of the ladies just asked me this morning. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I just <laughs> ask her. I have no idea, right? You asked me a question this morning. I'm like, let's find Erica. Let's <laughs> I often feel super insufficient. And like just a couple, actually a couple weeks ago, we were in Chicago. I woke up crying. Like it was so bad I woke up crying because I just feel like, constantly feel insufficient. But you know what I do? I just do it anyways. And I call it the power of my weakness. Yes. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 9 says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. That's me. Three times. God, please just take this insufficiency away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on, on me. I realized something. Why don't we like to have weaknesses? Because when we have weaknesses, then we have to depend on somebody, right? And I know it sounds messed up, but sometimes God allows weaknesses in our lives so that we could depend on him. Right? It's like, I don't, I don't know about you, but when I feel the weakest is when I pray more, when I read my Bible more, when I cry out to God more, which ends up making me closer to God, because that's when I feel the closest to God, when I feel weak. Right? And God likes it when you're put in that position where you feel weak. He likes it when you feel like you're insufficient. He likes it when you're untrained. He likes it when you don't know what you're doing. I know, again, it sounds messed up, but he likes it, because then you have to depend on him. And if any of these words describe you, that's a really good place to be. Because it says in the Bible, that's when his power will rest upon you. You depend on him, that's when his power is going to come upon you. I wrote it this way. Our insufficiency plus God's power equals the opportunity for miracles. The Bible says that if you have faith like a mustard seed, he can move mountains. So that means that he moves mountains with mustard seeds, right? That insufficient Small, insignificant mustard seed, right? And, and Mary, think about Mary, a teenage girl from the hood, okay? I looked it up. She is from the hood. That's who he decided to bring in Jesus into the world, the savior of the world. Not to discredit her, but talk about someone who might feel insufficient, right? That was Mary. And, I, and this is how I picture Jesus. If he had a basketball team, he would pick the most scrawniest, untrained, like he'd pick me because I cannot play basketball. <laughs> And he would still win, right? As a matter of fact, he did. Those were his disciples. The Bible, dis disciples are the people, if you're new to church, because we always, always make sure that we explain the Bible. Disciples are basically the people who traveled um, and, and spoke the Bible and also did miracles. The Bible says that his disciples were unschooled, ordinary men. I wanted to make sure I read that right. So if you're here and you feel insufficient in your workplace, Walk in confidence because he chose you. And it's a great place to be because now you're going to depend on him and his power is going to rest upon you, right? If you feel insufficient as a parent, right, talk about it. I feel like my kids are going to end up in, well, they are going to end up in therapy, okay? I just know it. And they're probably going to blame because Pastor JG is the saint. They're going to blame everything on me, okay? So I feel insufficient at times. But you know what? It's okay because God chose me to be the mom of these kids, right? And, his, and I'm going to depend on him. His power is going to rest upon me. They're going to be okay. Maybe if God has called you to start a business and you feel like you can't do it or write a book, whatever it is that God has called you to do, if you feel insufficient, it's a great place to be because, again, the Bible says his power will rest upon you. Just depend on 
him. Y'all, I'm so underqualified that Pastor JJ, I'm saying this as a joke, but this is for real. Pastor JJ asked me to speak in two weeks on a Sunday. I'm basically going to be preaching this message again because <laughs> your girl cannot put together. To, but listen, okay, it's all good. One of the girls was like, okay, does that mean we take off that day? No. Come and bring your friends because you know you have some friends here. They need to hear this word, okay? Just bring them with this. And don't think of it as like, that's messed up. I paid to be here and she's just going to say it again. All right? Just think of it as like, look, it's like the buffet. You get to have seconds, okay? Like, <laughs> oh, my gosh. You guys are hilarious. Now, and if you're thinking to yourself, but I'm worried that I'm not going to get something out of it, you will. And even if you're worried, learn to depend on him when you're worried. All right, Jeremiah 17.8 says, such trees are not bothered by heat or worried by long months of drought. They're not worried by long months of drought. This part is so important. They're not worried by long, long months of drought because the trees know, even though the trees don't have minds, okay, that's just, this is a metaphor, they know that the rain is coming again, right? They know it's a season. They know that God has shown up before and he's going to do it again. I feel like sometimes why we don't depend on God is because we have amnesia, right? We totally forget all the things that he's done in our lives. And if we would just remember what he has done, then we can rest in the fact that we know that he's just going to do it again. And the best, the best Bible verse I could, or the person in the Bible who I, I, I feel like the reason why I wanted to, to share this with you is David. David in the Bible. I love reading Psalms because He's so, like, all over the place. He's so bipolar. And, like, just so you know, I'm not discrediting if you're, like, actually bipolar. But if we're honest, we all have some bipolar in us, all right? Like, especially as women. Like, we'll, we'll go shopping. We're all happy. We come home. And the kids make a mess. And we turn into, like, the Incredible Hulk, right? Like, we get, this is just me. I don't know. Okay. Well, this is what David does. Psalms 77, 7 through 12 says, will the Lord walk off and leave us for good? Like how dramatic, okay. Will he never smile again? Is his love worn threadbare? I had to look up this word. I'm like, what does that even mean? And it's like means thin, okay. Has his love worn thin? Has his salvation promise burnt out? And this is him just complaining, right. Saying like, God, you have, you have forsaken me. God, has God forgotten his manner? Manners, has he angrily stomped off and left us? Just my luck, I said. The high God retires just the moment I need him. But then this is where he switches gears, okay? He goes from being upset and despair to realizing that he can depend on God. He says, once again, I'll go over what God has done. Lay out on the tables the ancient wonders. I'll ponder all the things you've accomplished and give a long, loving look at your acts. See, it wasn't until he remembered what God had done before in his life that he realized that he no longer had to worry what he was going to do his present situation. I get emotional because what I'm about to share with you are all the ways that God has shown up in my life. And what I basically do is I read this to myself or I just remember it every morning when I wake up because this helps me know that like God has been there and, and even if you're here and you feel like God hasn't really been there if you really think about it he has he was there when you almost died the day you got into a car accident and because you drove recklessly in the rain after a heated argument with your boyfriend and crashed into that light pole and he saved your life he was there when you were overwhelmed with grief because you made a decision to remove the baby from your womb because you were scared you couldn't raise that baby alone. And he helped you get through that guilt. He was there when you were bound to sex, drugs, and alcohol because you didn't know any other way to cope with your pain. And he showed you that you didn't need those things and that all you needed was him. He was there when you felt unworthy of love from all the countless guys that told you they loved you and later walked away. He showed you his love he showed you that his love for you was greater than any love you can ever receive from any guy. He was there when you were afraid of falling into depression because you lost your baby boy. And he gave you a newfound joy in the children you have now. He was there when you were called into ministry and felt like there was no way you could live up to the expectations of what it meant to be a pastor. And he showed you that even though you weren't worthy, he is. And his calling upon you and your love for people is what qualifies you. 
He was there when you were afraid of losing your husband in marriage to pornography and felt like you weren't enough for him. And he showed you that unconditional love and grace is what would heal your marriage. He was there when you felt like the weight of ministry was going to be too hard and you were going to break and you weren't going to make it and he gave you strength. And he's there now while you cry over the fact that your brother isn't serving God and you're afraid that you will not see him in heaven one day. I wrote it like this, when we remember what he has done, we can rest on what he will do. The theme of this conference is She Sees God. So for this session, she sees God has been and will be there for her. And for that reason, she will depend on him. And for you to see that, I'm going to do something. You're not going to go up to the front or get prayed for and all that because God is just going to minister to you right there in your seat. Because for you to see that, what I want you to do is take out your notebooks that you were given. Hopefully you have whenever you registered in the front. Or you could write it on your phone if you don't have your notebook. And what I'm going to ask for you to do is just write down the things that he has done in your life. Take a moment to write these down. And that as you, <laughs> this is so emotional, but as you write these things down, um, I ask Hillary, is Hillary here? Yes. I asked Hillary, thank you, Hillary. Can we give it up to Hillary? If y'all don't know who this is, she's super special to us. She started the church with us. We started almost six years ago. Now she's like a famous worship leader in like Texas. <laughs> so she came to be here with us. But as you're writing these things down, she's going to sing one of my favorite worship songs. Um, and let me explain it before we start. It's, it's called Love Note. And the reason why I chose this song is because Whenever you write these things down that he's done for you, this is basically like God's love note to you. This is God's way of showing you how much he loves you. And then after you write that down, the second thing you're going to write down, I'm giving you all homework. You're going to write down what you are depending on him to do now. See, whenever this country started, it was started on the Declaration of Independence. We were, we were claiming independence from the King of Britain, right? But now... What I'm asking you to do is to, this is basically your way of writing a declaration of dependence. When you write down how you're depending on God, this is your way of saying, now I'm depending on you as the King of King and the Lord of Lord over my life. So we're going from a no thanks I got this attitude to God, without you, I can't do this. So I'm going to pray. Then Hillary's going to sing this song and you guys can go ahead and write. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for this word. I thank you for this message. I thank you for what you're doing today. God, I pray. I believe, God, in a moment you could do miracles, God. So I pray that you would do a miracle today. I feel. I pray for these women that are here today that are going to write down all the things that you've, you've just done in their lives. Lord, show them how much you love them, how much you care for them. I know we're all struggling with worries about our future, God, worries about the present, maybe uh, family members or friends or whatever is going on in our lives. But I pray as we write down this list of everything you've done, that we would have the faith and know that you're going to continue to work in our lives. In your name we pray, amen. Dinner for two, just me and you. Let's take some time and sit down. down. I broke my bread. 
poured out my wine, did what it said to make you my bride. I'm bringing you back to the garden, back where it all started. All of your sins have been pardoned, and we just get to be together. Now 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 we just get to be together.
If you guys are still writing, you could continue writing. I'm just going to say a quick prayer. And then we're going to transition out into a small break before we go into our next session. Father God, thank you so much for surrounding us in this moment. We want to take this time to just give you all the glory and all the honor, God. We're so grateful that even in the fire, you allow us to produce fruit, Jesus. Thank you for being all around us, above us, behind us, God, with our families, Lord Jesus. In our insecurities, God, in our insufficiencies, you make yourself present. We love you, God. We love you, Jesus. Not just for the sacrifice that you did, but for the sacrifice that you make every day for us, God. Thank you so much for allowing us to be vulnerable with you and transparent with you and giving us your love through it all, God. We give you the glory, and in your name we pray, amen. You guys can, again, continue writing, um, you know, sit in the presence of the Lord, but we are going to have a 15-minute break. You can head out into the lobby. If you need to use the restroom, it's down this um, aisle, and enjoy your 15 minutes, and then we'll come back into the auditorium for our next session. begin believing 